people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Yoga event. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. While India has been making rapid gains in the fight against the COVID, it has urged its citizens to exercise caution amid speculations of a third wave hitting the country in a few weeks. The weekly infection numbers have although come down, the ease in restrictions following lockdown fatigue has prompted citizens throng hill stations and other tourist spots which the experts and the government believe could trigger a new wave if a COVID-compliant behaviour was not followed. The tourist sites, especially the hilly areas in India, are witnessing an overflow of visitors as the second wave-induced lockdown in April and May, which compounded people's COVID fatigue, has been lifted in many states and other restrictions too have been eased. And with vaccination drive picking up pace in the country, people are more confident. However, the authorities have urged people to not let their guard down, for this could reverse the progress India has made in past weeks and can lead to a third wave which is speculated to be more contagious and deadly. COVID appropriate behavior is absolutely essential. The pictures that we have seen today are frightening and we have to be very, very careful, very, very responsible and very, very cautious. Earlier, India reopened stadiums, adventure spots and eased their localised restrictions. Thermal screening and sanitizers have been made available all across. Picturesque Kashmir too opened whitewater rafting, one of the first adventure spots to reopen after the second wave. After the pandemic, the first activity in adventure sports is like mountain biking. Today, we are rafting. It will be a tourism boost. We want to boost it for adventure tourism. We want to boost it for such activities in the future. Because for the past two years, activities are very low due to the pandemic. And while Indian states have been gradually easing restrictions, the government has also ensured that the vaccination drive continues to receive a positive momentum. India's vaccination drive, the largest in the world, meanwhile has inoculated 370 million doses in the world and with both Covishield and Covaxin set to enhance their manufacturing capacity manifold in coming weeks, the momentum is going to be even stronger. India aims to inoculate all of its adult population by the end of this year. Meanwhile, in a major blow to the discriminatory and bigoted stance of the European Union, which has barricaded India's Covishield from getting a real recognition, UK Prime Minister backed India and said he saw no reason why Indian vaccine was not being given the permission. On your question about um, uh, the Serum Institute uh, of India and uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccinations, uh, I see no uh, reason at all why those, uh, why the MHRA uh, approved vaccines should not be recognised as part of the, uh, of the vaccine passports. And, uh, and I, I, I'm very confident that that will not prove to be uh, a problem. About 5 million people in Britain are thought to have had the vaccine made by Serum Institute in India. Around 320 million of these doses have been inoculated in India thus far. While the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine had shown nearly 80% efficacy in clinical trials, 
its competence grows up to 90% if the gap between the two doses is increased to 12 weeks, the studies have suggested. Moving on. As the assembly election date nears in the illegally occupied POK, the residents and the regional political parties have taken to streets, accusing the establishment of its involvement in the pre-poll rigging. They say the Islamabad's representatives who are perennially absent during the wars and crisis the region suffers have suddenly taken the centre stage to manipulate the electorate. The protests are also based on the fear of losing even the nominal autonomy like Gilgit Baltistan if Pakistan PM Imran Khan's PTI emerges victories through malpractice. <laughs> In the run-up to the assembly elections scheduled for July 25th, a large number of people in the illegally occupied POK took to the streets against the Pakistan establishment. They accused Imran Khan's government of pre-poll rigging through misuse and abuse of the state machinery. They said that apart from announcing a slew of SOPs, the government has been using both cash and coercion to influence the candidates and the electorate. This particular demonstration in Kotli was to oppose the arrival of Pakistan's Minister for Kashmir Affairs, Ali Amin Khan Gandapur, who according to the protesters was undemocratically and illegally managing the dynamics of the scheduled polls. So, Gandapur is standing in Mirpur. He is saying that you will give me one vote, two, one vote, one crore of rupees. Before this, he has also done this in the Gilgit election. And now he is coming here, he is also doing the Kashmiris, he is also doing the Jamuriyat, and he is also doing this election. ये इलेक्शन एक मखसूस जमात को और एक मखसूस टोले को जितवाने के लिए और अपनी मर्जी का एजेंडा जो है वो मुसलत करने के लिए यहाँ करवाए जा रहे हैं इसलिए हम इस तरह के नाम नहाद जो इंतहाबाद हैं जो जिनमें सिर्फ और सिर्फ इलाके पाकिस्तान के आमियों को हिस्सा लेने की इजाजत है और जिनको एजेंसियां क्लियर करती हैं उनको हिस्सा लेने की इजाजत है हम उनको टोटली मुस्तरद करते हैं ये फ्रॉड इलेक्शन है while calling political parties promises trickery and facade, the protesters said that the successive governments in Islamabad have done nothing except economically exploiting the region and suppressing the rights of the individuals who live there. Elections virtually held under the barrel of a gun have only emboldened them. Even the composition of the assembly has been such that Islamabad always has a way to install its stooges. While it has the right to select and send a few members, others who come through the so-called electoral process are allowed to contest only after proving their allegiance to Islamabad. International observers, we also appeal to them that they are especially looking at this thing. कि ये जो पाकिस्तान के वजीर यहाँ आकर एक मुतनाज़िया इलाके में एक मख़सूस पार्टी की मख़सूस समीदवारों की कंपेन चला रहे हैं और लोगों को बता रहे हैं कि फ़लां आदमी वजीर आज़म है और आप उसके साथ हो जाएं और फ़लां जीतेगा आप उसके साथ हो जाएं ये कोई इलेक्शन नहीं है टोटली हम इसको मुस्तरद करते हैं और हमारा मुतालबा ये है कि इलेक्शन के बजाय यहाँ से फौजों को निकाला जाए यहाँ से यहाँ राय शुमारी करवाई जाए ताकि इस मसले का कोई हल हो सके People in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir say that Islamabad is planning something sinister in the coming days. It could come on similar lines to what Gilgit Baltistan witnessed a few months back where it passed a resolution declaring it a province of Pakistan. And that happened despite the fact that UN resolutions do not give it such jurisdiction over the region. That happened despite locals and India's the real owner by virtue of instrument of accession signed by the King of Jammu and Kashmir, strong opposition. 
ایک ایسی حکومت بنانے کی کوشش کی جا رہی ہے کہ جو تقسیم کشمیر کے ایجنڈے پر مور ثابت کرے یعنی گلگیت سے یہ کوشش کی گئی ہے آپ نے دیکھا کہ وہاں اسمبلی سے یہ قرارداد منظور کروائی گئی کہ جی اس کو صوبہ بنایا جائے اب اس اسمبلی سے بھی یہ قرارداد منظور کروائی جائے گی Today's Pakistan occupied region was part of British India until 1947 when Maharaja Hari Singh would rule the undivided state of Jammu and Kashmir. And through an instrument of accession signed in October 1947, he decided to be a part of India. However, a rattled Pakistan with the help of mercenaries attacked the then militarily ill-equipped state of Jammu and Kashmir. By the time Indian forces landed there, it had occupied large swathes of territories that continue to endure its occupation and second-class treatment. Moving on, in what comes as a shock to optimists observing the Afghan situation, U.S. President Joe Biden has further advanced the complete withdrawal date of U.S. troops from Afghanistan and they will be vacating all their posts by August 31st. Taliban is now appearing invincible with more than 100 districts falling to them in just a few weeks. The Afghan National Army, which was dubbed, equipped and advanced to defend its territory, has fallen like nine pins. They have crumbled without even putting up a fight. Some have even run away. For now, nobody knows what Afghanistan is heading towards and what is waiting for poor Afghans. Call it a nine-pin fall, domino effect, or anything fancy that describes a sudden collapse and defeat, Afghanistan has tested it all in just a few weeks in the aftermath of the U.S. deciding to withdraw completely from the region. And while Taliban's accelerated resurgence had made observers believe that Washington might just consider it once more before vacating it in entirety, President Biden, who hasn't been explicitly speaking about the issue, has instructed a speedier drawdown. And despite Afghan forces' visible incompetence, growing fears among diplomats stationed in Afghanistan and countries considering repatriating its citizens, Biden believes that Kabul is capable enough to defend itself. We did not go to Afghanistan to nation build. And it's the right and the responsibility of Afghan people alone to decide their future and how they want to run their country. The Afghan government and leadership has to come together. They clearly have the capacity to sustain the government in place. The question is, will they generate the kind of cohesion to do it? Meanwhile, Russia said it is ready to help Afghanistan and its bordering countries that were being affected by the emerging crisis in the country. The statement came after Tajikistan called on members of a Russian-led military bloc to help it deal with security challenges emerging from Afghanistan. As of today, Taliban has overrun areas bordering five countries – Iran, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, China and Pakistan. Earlier, hundreds of Afghan servicemen had crossed the border with Tajikistan in response to advances by the Taliban. США не просто выводят войска из Афганистана, они выводят их де факто, признав провал своей 20-летней миссии. Террористическая угроза меньше не стала, наоборот, многократно возросла после 2001 года, когда туда вошли американцы. Наркотическая угроза Kabul residents fear the security situation in the country would worsen. They say Taliban rule will return and all the liberties they have obtained in the past two decades will be reversed. والا تشویش خود تنها از من تمام افغانستان تشویش بهی دارن که اگر این نیروهای آمریکایی از افغانستان خارج شوا طالبا و افغانستان تصرف میکنه و هیچ مردم افغانستان هیچ فرد افغان از طالبا رضایت کامل نداره دیگه مشکلات همین جاست که از روزی که آوازه و دروازه شده به کاروبار مردم بسیار لکمه وارد شده 
The stop start talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government haven't achieved anything substantial and their future too doesn't seem promising. And with Taliban making headways at an unexpected pace, they already seem to have lost their significance. A 90 situation is looming large and if the experts are to be believed, then Afghan forces cannot sustain Taliban even for six months once the forces are gone. And now in our section of Asia this week, the stories from across the continent that made news this week. The Indonesian government has set up an oxygen distribution station in the capital of Jakarta to meet the demands from hospitals as local citizens buy up local oxygen supplies amid a surge in COVID-19 cases. Indonesia has one of Asia's most severe COVID-19 epidemics exacerbated by the highly infectious Delta variant with hospitals overstressed, oxygen supply problems and a growing number of sick unable to receive medical attention. Private retailers of oxygen cylinders said their supplies have also been affected recently as demand has soared. Snaking queues of customers desperate for oxygen supplies for their elderly relatives were seen outside shops. Indonesia has been reporting more than 20,000 new cases and over 400 deaths per day over the past week as the spread of the more contagious Delta variant accelerated infections and strained the country's healthcare sector. With a total case load of around 2.3 million and death toll around 61,000, the country is the worst affected by COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. The United Nations top human rights official called on ASEAN countries to launch a political dialogue with the military junta and the democratically elected leadership in Myanmar with support from the international community. UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet recently told the Human Rights Council that the Association of Southeast Asian Nations bloc agreed a five-point consensus in April but unfortunately the Myanmar military leadership have shown little sign of abiding by it. She also said it is urgent for ASEAN to appoint a special envoy or team to get some kind of political dialogue underway. I encourage ASEAN to engage with the democratic leadership and civil society, not just the military front, she told the Geneva Forum. Japanese horse radish, also known as wasabi, has fiery taste and is an important ingredient in Japanese food. In Azumino, Nagano wasabi is used as ice topping. Nisei introduces hot soft ice cream. Visitors enjoy the taste comparison of two different soft ice creams. <laughs> Dayo Wasabi Farm, established in the year 1950, is Japan's largest wasabi farm, covering an area of 15 hectares. The farm grows the best quality Japanese horse radishes. The farm has been attractively developed for tourists with walking trails between fields. Wasabi can only be grown in distilled water and as you may know is blessed with sparkling clean spring water fed by snow melt from Japanese Alps. Yamba Dam is located in Nagano Hora, Gunma Prefecture. It was opened in 2020. It is built on the Agatsuma River. It took around 70 years to build the dam and it stands 131 meters high. This dam helps in flood control and irrigation and is also gaining popularity as a tourist destination because of being surrounded by mountains and a lake. 
このダムの上に一般の観光客の方が入れるようになりましてそれからたくさんの方が観光でいらっしゃっています今ですね湖を使った観光例えば水陸両用バスですとか船を浮かべたりあとカヌーやカヤックなどの水上アクティビティも楽しむことができるダムになっておりますこちらのフォー。Amid the COVID 19 pandemic, the Tagore Hall in Srinagar City remains an epicenter of art and culture. A perfect blend of music, dialogues, and beats of traditional musical instruments finally has broken the silence that was for long prevailing inside the four walls of the hall. Workshops on traditional folk theatre, popularly known as Bandpathi, Are being conducted here by some of the senior Kashmiri artists like Shah Jahan Bhagat. By involving young talent in this folk theatre, an attempt is being made to revive the centuries old legacy of the Union territory while connecting the youth to their roots. यहाँ इस सीखने आए कि कष्ट में कैसे पहना और बड़ों के साथ के साथ वो बड़े बड़े हम सिख हम लोगों को सिखाते हैं कैसे करना है परफॉर्मेंस होट टू वोक थिएटर के साथ और आज हम लोग इनके साथ हम भी सीख रहे हैं कि कैसे प्ले करना है वो हमको सिखा रहे हैं और हम उनके साथ सीख रहे हैं और हम लोग इस भांड पत्र को जिंदा रखना चाहते हैं Ranging from dialogue delivery to colorful costumes, the young artists are taught about each and every intricate element involved in performing Bandpati. After getting trained, they are even made to showcase their performance in several plays. A play named Yusuf Shah Chak. which tells the tale of the late independent muslim ruler of the valley is the latest addition in the list isme maine youth involve kiya hai ye youth maine isliye involve kiya hai ki jo hamara traditional culture hai wo din ba din mar raha hai maine isliye naye bacche isme laaye hain unko training diya maine the workshop kiya hai बेस दिन का और मैंने इनको तैयार करके यहाँ बुलाया टाइगर हॉल में इस वक्त हमें यहाँ ये प्ले करना है यूसुफ शाह चक जो नए तरीके से डॉक्टर सोहन लाल कोल ने लिखा है वो अभी तक बाड पर्स में अभी तक नहीं हुआ है Lately, efforts have been made by several dedicated groups and cultural academies to revive this traditional folk theatre. Moreover, many educated youth of the Kashmir Valley have also formed their own Bandpathir groups who give their performances at several stages so as to keep the traditional Kashmiri street theater alive. Bandpathir Revival Project was inaugurated in 2015 which was the biggest ever initiative to give a new flip and ease of life to one of the most vibrant theater tradition of Kashmir Valley. With that we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.
सब्सक्राइब टैग टीवी यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द नोटिफिकेशन बटन